Psalm 11, verse 3. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Listen to me. I maybe don't mind if I preach a little bit longer. Because I've got something. Thank you. And we give God all the glory. David wrote that when he was being hunted down by Saul. He was living in the wilderness when he wrote, if the foundations are destroyed. So the question is, if those foundations are flooded with evil, what can the righteous do? As a man of God, I've got to ask you, it's not fair for those of you that are young to have the weight of a nation on your shoulders. It's not fair for those of you that are in retirement and have labored the heat of the day to now be reinstituted into the front line of American life. It's not fair. It's not fair for me to look at a church that ought to be having fun for years in California. I've lived in California all my life. I'm glad to be moving back because I want to be one of the ones that isn't leaving. So when I say this to you, it's not fair. You have hopes and dreams and wishes, but so did they in 1941. And if they did not interrupt their lives, you would not have what you have today. So now it's our turn. It's our turn as a generation of American believers to tell our children, our grandchildren, you will have the freedom to go to church. You will have the freedom to say no. You will have the freedom to be safe. And we are not going to let the American dream die on our watch. Notice that Psalm 11.3 does not say, should the righteous do something? It assumes that. It says, what can the righteous do? And that is where we divide the churches that will be here in the future with an anointing and power and truth and those that will go by the wayside and be the tumbleweed of tomorrow. What should the righteous do? There's a little book called Born for Battle. Even though I wrote a book and I'm trying to sell it, I want to recommend another book. A little book that a lot of people have skipped over called Born for Battle, written by Arthur Matthews. And in the introduction of this book, you would think he had lifted in a time machine to this date in August in 2021 where he's explaining why he wrote Born for Battle, why he wrote this book. And listen to me. He said, I have the burden of the Lord. My burden relates to the flood of evil that the devil is pouring into the world. And at the same time, the passivity of many of God's saints as they view this state of affairs. And their ignorance of the part God expects them to play in this warfare against Satan. Now, the ignorance. Today I'm preaching about what role does the church take? What does the righteous do in this? The first thing, and this isn't the beginning of my sermon. I'm three quarters done right now. Please don't. Whenever a guy says the first thing, it doesn't mean it's the start. That was a long time ago. The beginning is the next thing he said. David said, what can the righteous do? And then he said, God is in his holy temple. Let me put that in modern language. Surely, David is innovating. The only thing the righteous could do is run. Buy a cabin. Fill a Grecian urn with brown rice and survive. I don't believe that. And David is saying, what can the righteous do? Do I run? And 
And then he said, God is on his throne. And he's saying, God isn't running and neither am I. God isn't running and neither am I. Everybody that believes God is still on his throne, give him a shout. Give him a shout right now if you believe that God is still on the throne. Esther is our final character in this message today. And Esther began her career in a beauty contest. Began her career hoping that by being queen, she could lobby for the safety of the Jews. The American church had a purpose for its existence. And even Mordecai, getting back to Esther for a moment, went along with it. She is now the favorite. She's getting dressed and ready to meet the king. There was a season where that made sense to believe that Christianity was a beauty contest. There was a moment where we could have gotten away with saying, let's grow our church by being culturally, intellectually, socially, and with coffee. <laughs> Attractive to society. We beautified the gospel. We took some of the distinctives that made it unattractive to the California lifestyle. We engineered it a little bit. And Esther was in that pursuit. It was still righteous. She was still a woman of God trying to be moral and in a situation where favor would come to the faith of the Jews and the state of the Jews. And one day Mordecai overhears something. He overhears something that instantly makes him a radical. He finds out that Haman has talked the king into committing genocide of the Jews. Now getting the people to believe that, Mordecai and Franklin Delano Roosevelt are identical. One is convincing corporate heads, the other is trying to convince a young pretty woman that the beauty contest is over. It's now something different. That's what I'm up here in my fragmented and inferior skilled way trying to tell the American church the beauty contest is over. This is not a day. L listen to me. Your sermon on how to have the best vacation ever. Your sermon about getting over your past. Your sermon about seven ways to deal with depression. It makes no sense. It is absolutely irrelevant. It is out of whack. It is, it is an anachronism. Now the sermon is this. The devil is about to choke America and God is raising up an army to stop him. Somebody, somebody help me right now.